So here's a quick tutorial and review about some of the most important inflation concepts, including what level we like it to be at, what are the dangers of it, some terminology, and that's about it. So inflation is defined as an increase in the overall price level, aggregate price level, you could say. Zero inflation is the very rare case of a constant price level from year to year, so the percent change in prices is going to be zero. Deflation and disinflation, there's a big difference. Deflation is a decrease in the general price level, whereas disinflation is just a slowing in the inflation rate. Still positive. Sort of like this. If prices are not changing over time, this would be a period of zero inflation. And then if prices were to rise over time, we would call that inflation. Now here's an important question. This new red segment, we see that inflation is changed. It's lower. Is it deflation or is it disinflation? It is disinflation. Still positive change in prices over time, but um, slower than it was before. What would deflation look like? It would be not just zero inflation, but actually decline in inflation. So this would be a, a deflation would be the sort of reduction in prices over time. If you want, you can think about it as deflation being actually negative inflation, whereas disinflation is still positive, but smaller than it used to be. All right, here's a bit of an inflation review. Calculation is percent change in overall prices from one year to the next. It's an annual measure. Uh, how are those prices measured? It's the consumer price index takes into account um, every month people collect data on hundreds of important prices that at the average urban consumer needs and meshes it all together, weights it by how important it is for the average person's budget, etc. And they come up with a, a composite number. So it's um, a number like this. If the CPI rose from 121 to 130, and you don't need to worry about that right now, how that's uh, calculated, we're just looking for inflation. Inflation is the percent change in the CPI from one, from one year to the next. So what would that be? Pause and calculate it if you want, and I'll share the answer. So inflation is just looking to uh, calculate the percent change in CPI from one year to the next. So you take the change over the first year's CPI. In this case, it went from 121 to 130. So subtract 121 from 130, divide by the first number, and you get 0.0744 or 7.4% inflation. So let's remind ourselves that low and stable inflation is one of the main goals of our policymakers. So what is so wrong with inflation? Why do people, why so many haters? Well, for one thing, inflation is a capricious redistributor of income. In other words, people on fixed incomes like retired people on social security, um, those people are going to experience a real loss in purchasing power and a loss in the standard of living um, because their income is not linked to inflation. And uh, on the other side, inflation reduces the real value of debt. So if inflation goes really high, um, this is going to be good news for borrowers and bad news for lenders because the lenders assumed a certain low inflation rate when they lent you the money and you're paying them back in dollars that are worth much less than they used to be. So these people are sad. These people are helped. Um, what about just the general uncertainty that is wreaked upon everybody when we're uncertain about uh, prices in the future? That's pretty massive for a free market economy. This idea of uncertainty, which makes decisions much harder, that's going to have a, a sort of a drain on the economy. It's going to be harder for producers and indeed anybody that is working on decisions involving prices to see what's happening between prices and to really figure out what's happening with relative prices. If everything's moving in a chaotic and unpredictable manner, it's really difficult to see what's happening. Uh, and then menu costs, you're going to have to spend a lot of time updating your prices more frequently reprinting menus even, um, literally, there's just, you pay attention to prices more and that um, is going to be a drain on your productivity.
Okay, well, if inflation is so bad, especially high unpredictable inflation, that's where it goes sideways. Uh, what about deflation? Should we have zero or negative inflation? No. Um, deflation can be even worse. Consider the case where prices are dropping every month and people are starting to postpone their purchases and of course the sellers are really hoping that doesn't happen, um, but they do and so postponement causes ripple effects over to the producers. They're going to order fewer cars because nobody's buying them and the cycle continues. Deflation also decreases the real debt burden, which means uh, that any debt you're holding is going to be harder to pay off. And so it's going to cause a further um, drain on the economy because people are going to try to uh, cut their spending to make up for this increase in debt burden. So you do not want deflation. Just ask Japan. So you might be asking yourself, self, is there an ideal level of inflation then? And around the world, most policymakers, central banks, have targeted around 2% inflation. That is high enough so that monetary policy has somewhere to go if they need to cut interest rates for a recession. Not so high that people start getting um, unclear about where prices are going and things get volatile. And it is not so close to deflation, and we know what's wrong with that. Um, so it's... To around 2% is what most uh, governments, policymakers go for. So this slide is very exciting. It's bringing the idea of inflation and connecting it with the wage setting, price setting curve. Um, so here are three different possible sources of inflation. Let's, let's reason through each of them. So if for for example, if owner's power rises relative to consumers, so let's say there's more monopolies, there's less sort of busting up of uh, large firms and, and mergers and acquisitions are happening unimpeded and corporate concentrations getting uh, larger, you would expect them to be able to charge higher prices and to get a higher markup, right? There's less competition. Um, and so what that looks like is the price setting curve shifts down as they... Um, get a higher markup. So um, remembering that this is wage over price, and so a, a lower price setting curve, other things equal, is a higher profit or markup for firms. So that would be a way to get inflation. And that's actually what a lot of economists are saying is happening in the post-COVID U.S. economy is um, sort of corporations able to pass along their costs, and even as inflation has begun to recede, still keeping prices high and um, getting away with it, basically. Now let's talk about the second bit, and it's got two parts. So another source of inflation, besides firms just charging high prices because of their ability to, um, you could actually even talk about how if costs for firms rise, they might um, that might be another reason for this cost push inflation. So basically, prices rising from the producer's side, or wages pulling up the cost of production, which would force costs to go up again. Um, and this idea of if, if workers become more empowered versus firms, they can get then a higher wage. And that can happen one of two ways. Either uh, in this top graph here, uh, increased union power. If, for instance, uh, the U.S. government reversed its war on unions that was started in the in the early 80s um, and unions were uh, it were it became easier to form unions you probably see an increase in the wage setting curve as as workers um, could ask for and probably more likely to get higher wages so that would be one um, that would pull that would push inflation up right um, and another thing would be if the economy went through a positive demand shock and unemployment dropped and as workers are scarcer, they can also push up um, wages, right? So those are ways that you can get inflation on the from the employee side or from the employer side. <laughs>